Okay, so it's about time for us to get started. Um, so what we were talking about last time was electric potential energy stored in the capacitor. We've got our equations for that, and then we talked about electric energy density, which was the energy stored in an electric field per unit volume. Um, today we're going to do one last example. I posted that as an announcement Monday morning, I think, so we're going to go through that example today. Um, we should be able to get through chapter 25 and get started on chapter 26. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, so let's get going. So in the class notes, this would be the slide that you probably have next. I'm going to take this one and I'm just going to move it to the extra examples. Um, it, it was a fine example to do when we didn't have a strike, but we did have a strike and we just kind of need to trim somewhere. This one doesn't fit in super well, so I'm just going to move this to homework and um, it's not really going to be something we work on. I think this one is more suitable. So it's a new example that ties in how we deal with capacitors and circuits and it brings in energy. So I think this one's going to be a little bit more beneficial for us. Next week is a problem session and I have another problem that's similar to this one. So this example will help in the problem set for next week as well. So for this question, we've got a capacitor network. The potential difference between points A and B is 12 volts. We're going to ask what is the total energy stored in the entire thing and how much energy is stored in this capacitor right here. So this is going to be a nice review for us how to deal with these circuits. So the first bit, we want to find the total energy. Probably the most efficient way to find the energy is to reduce this to an equivalent capacitance. So what's the equivalent capacitance between these two points? Then we'll know the capacitance and the potential, because we're given that that's 12 volts, so we can find the total energy. So we'll simplify as our first step. In our simplification, we see these two capacitors are connected in series, and these two capacitors are connected in series. So when we simplify a capacitor circuit, we start with the places where we can see the straightforward connections. These are two that are pretty obvious. These two are right in a row, these two are right in a row. So let's simplify these two first, and then we'll go to the next step. For capacitors in series, one over C equivalent is one, I think my handwriting's a little bit small, I'm gonna zoom in there, is one over the first capacitance, 8.6 microfarads plus one over the second capacitance, 4.8 microfarads. Um, you can do that on your calculator or you can do your fractions and you should find that the equivalent capacitance is 3.08 microfarads. Just to save us a little bit of time and a little bit of boredom from you, I'm not gonna write down all the algebraic steps there. I'm gonna assume you're okay with doing this on your calculator. For our top connection here, the equivalent is 1 over C equivalent is 1 over 6.2 plus 1 over 11.8. That gives us a C equivalent of 4.06 microfarads. So now we'll redraw our circuit. We'll put in the equivalences that we found, and then we'll see what we can do with our next step. redraw. So to redraw, we've got point A here, the 8.6 and the 4.8 combined to give us a 3.08. Then we come up to this branch, the top one is a 4.06. And the bottom branch is 3.5. So 
So we want to do another equivalent because we're trying to simplify it. We ask what's the next obvious connection? The 4.06 is top to top and bottom to bottom with the 3.5. So these two are in parallel. That's a parallel click connection, so we'll do a parallel equivalent here. And resistors are connected in parallel. We just add up the capacitances. So 4.06 plus 3.5. This equivalent capacitance is 7.56. Redraw again, we put in this equivalence that we just found. So I've got my point A, my 3.08. Negate the 4.06 from the 3.5, put in a 7.56. If I look at this, I ask how are those connected? Those are all in a line, those are connected in series, so I've got one more equivalence to do. So one over C equivalent is one over 3.08 plus one over 7.56 to give us 2.19. And for our very last step, we just draw the last circuit we have. So we have a 2.19 microfarad capacitance with a 12 volt potential, so we can find the energy. C times delta V squared divided by. That energy turns out to be 2.63 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay. So if we do the find the equivalent capacitance, then we can find the total energy stored in the system. Any questions there? Okay. So now the next part, we've got to take what we know about our connections. And we're asked to find what is the energy stored in the 4.8 microfarad capacitor. So the idea is going to help us here. We know we can find potential energy. We can do C times V squared over 2. That's one valid expression. We could also do Q squared over 2C, right? So we've got those different equations for potential energy. We know the capacitance is 4.8. If we could find the charge on this capacitor, then it would be really easy to find the energy stored in it. So what we know is that capacitors in series carry the same charge. If I look at my picture, this one is the series combination of these two. So the charge on this one is the same on the charge of both of these. So these have the same charge. This one is this one. So the charge here is the same. This one is a series combination of this one. So the charge on the 4.8 is the same as the charge on the 3.08, which is the same as the charge on the 2.19, because those are all series combinations. So if I find the charge on this one, it's going to give me the charge on this one, and then knowing the charge, I can find the energy. So that's my strategy. So we'll try and get our notes nice and complete so it's not confusing when you go back to study. So part B, we'll redraw that equivalent circuit, A and B, 2.19 microfarads. I'm going to find the charge on this one. So Q is equal to C times delta V, 2.19 microfarads times 12 volts. So the charge on this capacitor is 2.63 times 10 to the minus 5 coulomb. Okay, now let's remember where this one came from. So if we back up a step, 
in our circuit drawing. This one came from 3.08 and 7.56. So they both have to have the same charge. So the charge on this one is also Q. Back up another step. The 3.08, or properly back up. So the 7.56 came from this one. And this is still 3.08. And then we back up one more step. This 3.08 was the 8.6 combined with the 4.80. So they have to have the same charge Q as well. Okay. So is that all good? All those series things all had to have the same charge. Now that we know the charge and the capacitance, we can find the energy. U is equal to Q squared divided by Q times C. That energy turns out to be 7.19 times 10 to the minus 5 joules. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I just noticed a goose in my notes. The very end step of part A here where I wrote down the potential, I wrote down the wrong number. I wrote down the charge instead. I just looked at the wrong place in my notes. This number is actually 1.58. 10 to the minus 4 joules. Sorry, I hate making mistakes, but it is important to fix them when you catch them. Okay, any questions? So we're going to skip that Geiger counter. So that's the last thing I wanted to do in this chapter, which means we're ready to start chapter 25. Just any questions about capacitors and energy and stuff before we move on? to save a little bit of time, I'm going to assume, we'll do a very quick review, but I'm going to assume you're all comfortable with the idea of the fact that current is moving charge, resistance is a way to characterize a resistor when it's hard for current to flow through, and that you know that a battery supplies potential. So I'm going to assume you're kind of comfortable with all those ideas. We'll go through the highlights here. Um, you might want to read the chapter background if you're a little bit, if you need a little bit of a refresher. And then, of course, by all means, you can ask any questions you have. Um, when it comes to test-like questions, I won't ask you anything deeper than I do right here on these pages. So you don't have to expect anything really in-depth about this stuff. So the few slides we're going to go through for chapter 25, we're going to talk about current, current density, resistance, and resistivity and conductance. So those are our basic ideas that we have to make sure we're good about. So, so far in this course, all of the conductors we used, we always talked about conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. The conductors didn't have any charges moving around inside them. Now we're starting circuits. Um, so that is gonna have moving charges. So the way we get a moving charge, if we take some sort of a conductor, like a copper piece of wire, and if we connect it to a battery or a source of potential, so we'll take this wire or whatever it is, this conductor, we'll connect it to a battery that has a potential delta V. It's gonna establish a potential difference across the two ends of the wires. Let's say that's the positive end and that's the negative end. 
When we put a potential difference across the distance, it's going to create an electric field. So there will be an electric field inside the wire because we've established a potential difference across the wire. If we have an electric field inside the wire, it means that the charges are going to feel an electric force. The free electrons or the conducting electrons, I don't remember my chemistry all that well, those are the ones that are allowed to move. So they're going to feel an electric force, they're going to move through the material. Um, the way they move depends on a whole bunch of stuff characteristic to the conductor. Um, that's explained pretty well in your textbook. The idea we need to know is the fact that when we have moving charges, that's what current is. Our definition of current is the rate at which an amount of charge delta Q passes through some area A. Current has a symbol of typically an uppercase I, but sometimes it will be a lowercase I, so either uppercase or lowercase. Pretty much always an I though. The units of current are amperes after, I think it's Andre Ampere, I can't remember his first name, amperes. Um, more often called amps, and the symbol for that is a capital A. So our units are A. Um, the equation, current, is the amount of charge that passes in some amount of time delta Q, right, going through an area. So that tells us that an amp is a coulomb per second, so coulombs over seconds. This would be our expression for average current. Current, of course, can change over time. So an instantaneous current would just be dq by dt. So if you had a function for your current, how that changed over time, you would take the derivative to know what the current is as a function of time. Um, we now, in 2023, and for a lot of time, we now know that current is moving electrons. When people started to study current, they had no idea about electrons. So the definition of the direction of a current flow was the direction of flow of a positive charge. And we stay with that convention. So if an electron moves to the left, it's the same thing as saying that a positive charge would move to the right. So that is our convention for direction of current flow. So current flow has a direction. Um, it's sort of a little quirk that current does have a well-defined direction, the motion of the positive charge. Because it has a well-defined direction, it is a vector quantity, but we don't write I with the vector symbol on top. Um, kind of nobody does that in the textbooks. I think you're justified if you do it, but typically you don't do it. So then we said current was the amount of charge passing through a surface area A. So sometimes we're interested in that area A, which takes us to current density, which is just current divided by area. So that's a definition we'll use a little bit. So current density is the current divided by the cross-sectional area A. That has a symbol of J. Because current density is related to current, it also has a direction. The direction is the same as the current. And our quirk of physics, we do write this one with the arrow. Okay. They're both vectors, they're both related, but we write this with an arrow and we don't write this one. The units, because it's current over area, the units are amps divided by meters squared. Or I suppose you could also say coulombs divided by seconds times meters squared. That's legitimate too because an amp is coulombs per second. So our definition for current density is that J is current divided by area. And then our current density J and our current I both depend on how charge moves through a material. We're going to talk about DC circuits first, so things that go in one direction only. Later on, after we do magnetism, we'll get into AC circuits where it switches back and forth, um, but we've got to cover our magnetism first. Okay, questions here?
So next important result, and we're going to use this one a fair bit, is Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law is a purely experimental result. So George Ohm, I think was German, did experiments on materials and he found that for a certain class of material, the current density depended on the electric field inside the material. So that's sort of the original version of Ohm's Law. So an experimental result which states that for ohmic materials, and ohmic materials are pretty much exclusively conductors. Okay, so not insulators and not semiconductors, but most conductors. It says that the current density is proportional to the electric field. So our current density, J, is proportional to the electric field maintained throughout the material itself. If it's proportional, we can write it with a constant of proportionality. J is equal to what we call sigma times the electric field. This constant of proportionality sigma is called the conductivity. And I wrote down what it means here. Conductivity is basically a numerical value to describe how easy it is for current to flow through a material. Um, where we came up with these conductivity values is we measured J, we measured E, and we just plotted sigma. We calculated sigma for a bunch of different materials. And then we have charts of what those values are. Um, conductivity would have units of J divided by E, so amps divided by volts times meters. We also like to write that E would be one over sigma times J. One over sigma is what we call the resistivity. E equals rho times J. This symbol rho stands for the resistivity. Be careful with rho, that shows up in a bunch of different places. When you use that symbol, you have to make sure you know which one it means. Um, resistivity is the inverse of conductivity. So conductivity is a measure of how easy it is for current to flow. Resistivity is a measure of how difficult is it for current to flow. Okay? So they're just inverses of each other. Um, if something has a high conductivity, it's easy for current to flow. And that's true if it has a low resistivity. If it has a low conductivity, current doesn't flow very well. And that's also true if it has a high resistivity. So we can take this expression and turn it into what we're more familiar with for Ohm's Law. If we remember that electric field is potential divided by the length of our wire, and we put in that our current density is current divided by area, we can get a new expression for Ohm's Law that says delta V divided by the length of our object the length of our wire is equal to the resistivity times the current divided by the area. Okay, so we just do a straight substitution there. We can rearrange this and solve for delta V. So the potential difference across the ends of an object with length L is equal to rho times the length divided by the area times the current I. So we see that for ohmic materials, mostly conductors, the potential across the two ends is proportional to the current through it. If we increase the potential, we increase the current. We get a higher current flow. This constant of proportionality, rho times length divided by area, this is what we call resistance. And that gives us our more familiar form of Ohm's law equals IR. This is probably the one most people remember for Ohm's Law, which is fine. Two ways to say the same thing. So conductivity sigma and resistivity rho, those are material properties. Any hunk of copper, no matter what its shape and size, will all have the same conductivity. Resistance R is a property of the device itself. So it depends on what the thing is made of, rho, the resistivity. It depends on how long it is, and it depends on what the area is. So if you have two copper wires, 
that are different lengths in different areas. They'll have the same resistivity, because that depends on the fact that it's copper, but they'll have different resistances, because that depends on the size and shape. So these are material properties, and this is a device property. So our resistance has a symbol R. The units are called ohms, which we write with a capital omega. Okay, that was all really fast. Any questions? I figure you've seen most of that in Physics 1051, and maybe some of it in high school physics as well. Okay, if you have any questions, let me know, and we can do more in class, or we can answer it one-on-one -on -one if stuff comes up. So let's do take time and do at least one example. So for our example, let's take a 2.55 meter long piece of copper wire. Let's connect it to a 1.5 volt battery. So that's just like the little AA batteries, 1.5 volts. We're going to use a device and we're going to see that we actually get a current of 60.4 amps running through it. That's a big current, so we put an exclamation point. So let's ask some basic questions based on the things we just did. First of all, let's find the resistance of the wire. So the things we know are that the length of the wire is 2.55 meters. We know that the potential difference across the two ends is 1.5 volts. And we know that the current through it is 60.4. For the resistance of the wire, we can use our own flaw, delta V equals I times R. So our resistance R is delta V divided by the current. Zero point zero two four three ohms. So there's our resistance of the wire, very small resistance. What is the diameter of the wire? So here we'll remember that the resistance depends on the size and shape of the object. So resistance R is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the area. Resistivity times the length. The area of a wire, it's a cylinder, so the area is the area of a face. It's just pi R squared. That means that the radius of the wire is going to be rho times L divided by pi times R take the square root. Our resistivity, we'll just look it up in our table, the resistivity of copper is 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8. Multiply that by the length divided by pi and the resistance. We get a radius of the wire, 0 0.750 millimeters. The diameter is twice that, 1.5 millimeters. And that's fairly typical for a piece of copper wire. You can buy a Princess Auto or Canadian Tire somewhere. Okay, part C, what's the electric field inside the wire? So electric field is potential divided by the distance. The potential was 1.5 volts divided by the length 2.55 meters equals 0 0.588 volts per meter. So there's our electric field that's established within the wire making those charges move around. What is the current density in the wire? J is the conductivity or 1 over the resistivity times the electric field. So 0 0.588 volts per meter divided by 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8 gives us 3.42 times 10 to the 7 amps per meter squared. Part E, was this a good idea? Okay, that's kind of a good question. Is it a good idea just to hook up a wire to a a battery? What do you think? Definitely not. This is what's called a short circuit. So if you connect something with a really small resistance to a wire, 
what you end up getting is a very high current. What does it mean that it's a very high current? There's a lot of charge flowing through that wire, and it's flowing through very fast. It has a lot of energy that it gives off. How does it give off energy? Heat, right? This gets really hot. If you touch it, you'll burn your hand. Um, and then if it touches something else, something combustible, it's going to catch on fire. Okay, so was this a good idea? No. Um, what might you remember this from? If you did physics 1051, you probably did the DC motor lab where you hooked up your coil of wire to a power supply and it started to spin. And the lab staff were probably very insistent that you didn't let it spin for very long because it got hot. And this is why, right? You just had a piece of wire hooked up to a high voltage and it made a high current running through it. Yeah, so these things get hot. And then to segue into our next chapter, we are going to work on some circuits with resistors. We're going to talk about voltmeters and ammeters. Those are devices to measure potential and current. So we're going to be drawing lots of circuit diagrams. So we're going to use these symbols along with our symbol for our capacitor, which was two parallel lines, and a switch, which is just one little bit up and the rest down. So our resistor is a squiggly line. When we talk about wires, we're going to be talking about ideal wires. So our last example was real, honest, true, realistic copper wire that had an actual resistance. When we get into our circuits, we're going to assume that these have no resistance at all because those are more complex to analyze. You would have to think about the potential drops across those resistances. Batteries will draw as we have been all along. Um, some batteries have internal resistances. We're going to skip over those. And then our voltmeters and ammeters, capacitors and switches. So those are all coming up in the next bit. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do with chapter 25. Any questions? Yeah, and I'm really sorry about having to go quickly through this. Um, it's all of a fallout from the strike. You know, we missed eight classes and something has to give. Um, and it's really hard to find things to trim from Physics 2055. Like all of the topics are so important. So this one just felt like something you were more familiar with, which is why I decided to skim through it. Um, it stinks for you guys that you're getting a fallout from this strike. It is just terrible. Okay, chapter 26. So, yep. Are you going to go to the circuit for ammeter and voltmeter in this chapter? Yeah, this chapter is going to have ammeters and voltmeters. The circuits of those, right? Yeah, yeah. And we'll talk about what the resistances are and why we build them the way they do. Yeah, so those are coming up for sure. Um, so in a previous chapter, we did capacitor circuits, series, parallel, and combinations. Now we're going to do resistor circuits. So we're going to talk about series and parallel combinations. We'll see combination circuits and how we analyze those. Um, then we're going to go into our C circuits. This is all going to be DC current, so current flowing one way. And then after we do our magnetism, we will get to the AC circuits and we'll bring inductors in. So for our resistors in series, when we had our capacitors in series, we said that every charge that came out of the battery had to land on a plate, repel from another plate. All capacitors in series had to have the same charge. Resistors in series are similar. So when we hook up a set of resistors in series, first of all, that means they're all in a row. So we come from one resistor to the next, to the next, no branching at all. So series means no branching. When we make our complete circuit, charge flows out of the battery. That's what we call current. And the current has to flow through the first resistor and the second and the third before coming back around and back through the battery. So each of these resistors will have to carry the same current I. So any resistor set in series do have to have the same current. Our potential V, this has to be divided up over the three resistors.
And here's where we'll put our Ohm's law to use. We know delta V is going to be the current times the resistance. So that total potential is going to be divided over the three resistors. We can write that as an equation. The total potential is the potential across one plus the potential across two plus the potential across three. So the current has to be the same. The potential is divided. We can make, just like we did for our capacitors, we can make an equivalent circuit. And what an equivalent circuit means is we take out R1, R2, and R3. We put in a new resistor that we call R equivalent. And when we hook up this new equivalent resistor to the same battery, it draws the same current. So our equivalent circuit has the same battery, same current with this equivalent resistance. So now what we can do is if we apply our Ohm's law, in this diagram, we know that delta V equals current times the equivalent resistance. So delta V is the current times the equivalent resistance. Delta V is also equal to the sum of these three potentials. Delta V1 is I times R1. Delta V2 is I times R2. Delta V3 is I times R3. So in our expression, each term has the same current I. We can divide both sides by I. And we're left with our expression for equivalent resistance for a set of the resistors connected in series. Um, a place where I will caution you is notice that the equation for resistors in series is the same as the same, same form as the equation for capacitors in parallel. Don't get them confused when you're on a test. Like it's fine when you're doing your homework, you're probably going to keep it straight, but on a test you're moving pretty fast. So just try and always make sure you remember that those are different equations. The next slide is a pretty straightforward plug and chug example, so I'll post the answers to that one for you. And then we'll talk about resistors in parallel. For our resistors in parallel, parallel has the same definition as it did for capacitors. They're connected top to top and bottom to bottom. So our resistor R1 was out of one end into the battery, out of the other end into the battery. Resistor R2 is out of one end into the battery, out of the other end into the battery. So they're connected top to top and bottom to bottom, same as R3. When things are connected in parallel, they have the same potential. So anything connected in parallel has the same potential because we go right from the resistor to the battery, and that's true with all three of them. And we don't lose any potential over those wires because they're ideal wires. So parallel all has the same potential. So each battery, delta R1, R2, and R3 have potential delta V, delta V, and delta V. When it comes to current in these circuits, the battery will draw a total amount of current on it. But the current gets to a point in the circuit where it has a choice of where to flow. Part of it can come down and part of it can come forward. So that's how we know it's not in series because the current branches. The amount that comes down through R1, we can call I1. This bit of current that went forward, that has two choices, can come down here or down here. The bit that comes down this branch we'll call I2, and this branch will be I3. So this total amount of current has to split over the three resistors. So the total current I is I1 plus I2 plus I3. So just like we did for our series circuit, we can draw an equivalent circuit. In our equivalent circuit, we take these three out, we put in a new resistor, when we connect that new resistor to the same battery, it draws the same total current I. So both these circuits have the same amount of current leaving the battery.
Then we use our Ohm's law again, V equals IR. So our current here on this side is delta V divided by R equivalent. You can put that in this equation. I1 is going to be delta V divided by R1. I2 is delta V divided by R2. And I3 is delta V divided by R3. If we look at this equation, we have delta V on top on both sides. So we can divide through by delta V. And we're left with our equation for finding equivalent resistance for resistors connected in parallel. And again, we notice that the equation for resistors in parallel is the same form as the equation for capacitors in series. So just be cautious with those when you're working on them. Okay, the next slide is an example, so just a plug and chug example. We can, so like we did with capacitors, we did combination circuits and we saw how to simplify those. You can do those circuits with resistors. That's one way of analyzing the circuits. We're not gonna bother with that part because it's not the method we use most often and we're gonna skip straight to Kirchhoff's laws, which is kind of a robust method of applying for any circuit you can look at. So that's where we're gonna to jump to next. With Kirchhoff's laws, I'm going to assume, and you can stop me if I'm wrong, I'm going to assume you've seen it in Physics 1051, but you would probably like some extra practice. So that's my assumption. Um, stop me if I'm wrong. If you're 100% comfortable with it, we can skip on through it. But that's where I'm going to work from, and then if I'm, you want less work, then we can kind of skip it. So with our Kirchhoff's laws, What's kind of interesting is we've been using these concepts sort of the whole time we've been talking about capacitors and resistors, but these more or less formalize them. So Kirchhoff's laws come from conservation of charge and conservation of energy. They're just statements of that as they apply to circuits. So the first law is the current law, sometimes called the junction law. That's really just conservation of current. And it says that the net current into any junction, let's make sure we know what a junction is, a junction is a place where two wires meet, possibly more than two, but it's a meeting point between wires. The net current into a junction is equal to the net current out of a junction. So any charge that flows in also has to flow out. That makes sense because the charge can't go anywhere. It can't fall off onto the floor. It has to stay in the wires. So if we have a current I1 flowing into the junction, then we might have current I2 flowing out through this one and current I3 flowing out through this one. So in equation form, we would say I1 is I2 plus I3. So there's our junction law or current law. Our potential law is conservation of energy because we know potential is energy per unit charge. And it says that for any closed loop, and the closed loop bit is important. It does have to be a closed loop, so it can't have a branch open. For any closed loop, the net change in potential has to be zero. So in this loop, we have four things. I'm gonna label them as each having a potential difference of delta V, one, two, three, and four. When we add all of those up, delta V1 plus delta V2 plus delta V3, plus delta V4, they all have to add up to give us zero. Okay, so the total potential around a closed loop has to be zero. Something that you might notice here is that these are all added up, right? But they all have to add to zero. Mm -hmm. That means some potentials are increases, some delta Vs are positive, some potential differences are decreases, some delta Vs are negative. So the next thing we'll do is we'll talk about how do we know when a potential is positive and how do we know when it's negative. If it's positive, it supplies energy to the system, and if it's negative, it dissipates it in the system. So 
So let's think about a simple circuit. And in our simple circuit, we're gonna have a battery. So here's the physical picture, here's the circuit diagram. We're gonna connect it to two ideal wires, or these black lines here. And we're gonna connect it to what you might call a load or a resistor. So there's our resistor. So there's our simple circuit. We know that as soon as we close that circuit, we are going to get current flow. So I can put that in my picture. There's my current I. So current is gonna flow around that battery. So let's think about what's happening in our battery first. As the current flows through the battery, it goes from this end of the battery to this end. Um, this is the negative end, this is the positive, so it goes from a low potential to a high potential. That means delta V, as the current flows through the battery, has to increase. As it goes from negative to positive, it increases. Delta V battery, positive. That tells us that batteries supply energy to a circuit. Um, that matches what we know that a battery does. Okay, so there's our potential increase as we go through a battery. Next, we'll think about what's going on in the resistor. So if you think physically about what's happening, is we're hooking our resistor up to a source of potential. It puts a potential difference across the wire. In putting the potential difference, it establishes an electric field inside the wire, and current moves in the direction of the electric field. The direction of the electric field in this resistor points this way. We know that electric field goes from high potential to low potential. Or from positive to negative. Okay, so there's some things we know about current flow and electric fields and potentials. So as our current goes through the battery, it goes from high to low. This is a potential decrease. So delta V for our resistor is less than zero, we get a decrease. So as a rule of thumb in our circuits, and we're gonna get into specifics and I'm gonna give you the tools to always figure it out, but as a rule of thumb, we get potential supplied, positive potential from a battery, and negative potential differences from a resistor. That's where we're gonna go from. Let's take this and let's apply it to our circuit diagram and do a very simple loop rule. When we apply our loop rule, the very first thing we do is we draw the loop in the circuit. To make, you can draw your loop any way you want. To make your analysis easiest, typically you're gonna draw your loop to match your current. Um, and that's just for ease of analysis. It's not a rule that you have to do it, it just makes life easier. So the current comes around this way, we're gonna draw our loop this way. So you have to have an orientation for your loop and that's the one I'm gonna pick. Kirchhoff's voltage law or loop rule says that the potential difference of the battery plus the potential difference of the resistor has to sum to be zero. So let's put this into effect. So our potential difference as we go around our loop through the battery, our loop goes from negative to positive, that's a potential increase. So the potential difference of the battery is positive of the potential epsilon. Um, when you're writing your equations, you don't necessarily have to put the plus sign in there. I try to do it just to make a point, but if you leave it out, it's implied that it's positive. Then as we go through our resistor, remember our current flows from positive to negative. So we're coming through our loop this way, the loop goes positive to negative, it's a potential decrease. And Ohm's law says that potential is I times R. And that has to sum to be zero. Okay, so that's the heart of it. We definitely don't have time to start an example. Are there any questions before we quit for today? Okay, so we'll keep going on Friday. Um, this is the topic that I asked Brad to go over in the problem session next week, so you get a little bit more exposure to it there as well.